Now we have, okay. There's one thing I did want to say, now we're coming up to this uh, choice of um, volunteer uh, client. Um, I would, and I'm sorry, I should have said this before, it would be helpful if you had, could just note down a few uh, things about yourself, a few statements about yourself uh, on a piece of paper with your name. Uh, if you intend to uh, come up and uh, volunteer uh, as a uh, client for this interview. Uh, we should have given you a little more time for that, but um, maybe you can do it in a hurry. So we will take a break, and those who are willing to volunteer for the interview can meet Ruth over in this corner, uh, and, we'll, uh, and we'll get together again at 15 minutes at the outside, 10 minutes start back, okay? I don't know what might be of concern to you, but I'd certainly be very glad to, to hear. Well, um, my problem kind of is old and new together. I um, lost a set of twins about two and a half years ago. And for me, that was a first pregnancy and working on my career and whatnot. I kind of put pregnancy aside thinking when I'm done with my career, I'll have children. And so that first pregnancy didn't work out very well. And with my age, I'm 35 now as I'm getting older and I've been trying for two and a half years to become pregnant and have not done so successfully, I've kind of, you know, started to feel one like a failure. Um, and I think it came from once I read a poem and the poem said, that to have a child is to have your only chance of making a miracle with God. And I never looked at it that way before. I always thought pregnancy was the pits, you were fat, you were ugly. And I didn't enjoy my pregnancy at all. And when I did start to enjoy it, that's when I lost the twins. And so now I'm upset that I can't become pregnant. And the, and, but right now, at this very minute, I could be. And that's scary to me, too. Mm -hmm. But it's really a, a sort of a double problem that you would like pregnancy to be something you would enjoy. And uh, yet when you began to enjoy it, you lost the twins. Uh, and now it really is a confusing situation, isn't it? Of wanting a child very much, wanting that miracle. Yet not being sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm sure that I want that. Okay. I'm, I'm more afraid that if I am pregnant this very minute, that there's loss down the road. Mm -hmm. Ah, mm -hmm. that's where the past comes in. It, right. it might end in tragedy again. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one of those points now where every month I wait to see if I'm pregnant, and every month I'm dis disappointed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a recurring issue. Right? It never seems to get any better. And I don't, I don't really discuss it with anybody. I don't talk to my husband about it mm -hmm. because he has the pain from the past as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's something that really has been quite bound up in you. We haven't felt free to talk about it. Right. And, and I guess I question myself in a lot of ways too. Is it, if I had made attempts earlier, mm -hmm. would it have been easier? Mm -hmm. Should I have laid aside my career a little earlier and tried to become pregnant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because now, I mean, when most of my friends are having children and raising them, I have a job to go to, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, four or five years ago to me, you know, I'm out in the world, I'm making money, I'm doing a good job. Mm -hmm. But now there's a lot of things that I don't have, nobody to leave anything to. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a sad thing. Christmas is coming. It's probably on my mind more mm -hmm. because... Uh, I would have had somebody that's two and a half, I would have had two little kids two and a half years old. Mm -hmm. And so you're asking, did I make a mistake? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's I guess that's that's a scary thought to think that your whole life has been a mistake along the way. Mm -hmm. Did I make a very grave error in not having made the attempt sooner? Right. And and I look at it that more and more things seem to play on it. The pressure from my family. Uh, I'm an only child, so consequently my, my mother always would, you know, wanted to have a grandchild. Um, she has a terminal illness now and could possibly die. I mean, it could go on forever yeah. for a long time, but... You know, as if I haven't given them what they'd like mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's a lot of pressure toward, you must have a child, you must. Yeah. And I, but I, I guess I, there's, I think of so many things that go on with that with me. It's, I, I believe in you either win or you lose, and to me right now I've lost. I'm not quite sure. You feel... It was win or lose, and you have lost. Yeah, to me, to me, I always I, I play games. I do things to win, and oh, in the pregnancy, I you know, I wanted to win to have the child, and mm -hmm. instead, I lost. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to play things that I can lose. So that's one game, a very important game that you feel you lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're the kind that likes to win. Definitely. Definitely. And I, I like to make people happy as well. And I know my husband, my parents, all of those other people would want, you know, a child, an offspring, a grandchild, as well as I would like one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not like I'm just trying to do it for somebody else. I mm -hmm. think there's that part of me that says, you know, this is normal, this is proper. You lost twins. How can you replace? What can you do to have that? So you'd like to not only satisfy yourself, but all these other people, too. I think everybody would be happy in the mm -hmm. long run, and me especially. Mm -hmm. It just means a tremendous lot. Yeah. I, I don't think there's anything that I could, if I, if I cannot have children, I guess I would have to deal with that. But I don't think there's anything I can replace that with. Mm -hmm. I don't think... Career used to be extremely important to me, and now that's not the ultimate thing in my life. So that if you don't have a child, that really leaves a, a terrible gap. A, yeah, a very big void for me. A big void. Mm -hmm. Right. I, you know, I have a very loving, nice, wonderful husband, and I care about him a great deal, but there's that extra thing that we could share together. Mm -hmm. You know, out of the love that we do have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And somehow I feel cheated. Mm -hmm. You feel cheated out of something that would enrich your marriage as well as you? Yeah. And like I said, with the possibility of being pregnant right now, there's just, it's like I don't want, I don't believe I'm telling a whole crowd of people this, but I don't really want to tell anybody because I'm afraid of, you know, of the loss, and yet yeah. it bothers me tremendously. Yeah. 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 No, I can understand that. that it, uh, it's the kind of thing where mentioning it might, might be superstitiously wrong or something. I mean, it might... Uh... Well, that, and I guess if I am pregnant, I would like it to be... Nobody knows until they can really, really tell, and maybe it's going to last that time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that in many ways, it's something you still want to keep to yourself, and yet find yourself telling a lot of people. Yeah. As far as, you know, as far as telling anybody my possible condition, that, that I haven't done. And... I don't know. It's, it's something I'm not going to tell my parents. I don't even think I'll tell my husband for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So it really is something highly personal and kept within and easier to talk about to strangers than it is to people who mean a lot to you. Yeah, because the people that mean a lot to me could also have the hurt again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And you don't I, want to lead them on and then no, they go another tragedy? No, not like the last one. Mm -hmm. That was very hard. And I, I don't know, I guess maybe I should just see what comes of it, you know, except if something good comes, fantastic. If something bad comes, then I'm hurt again. Nobody else is. Ah, I see. Uh -huh. If you keep it to yourself, then if it all works out, great for everybody. Right. If it's a tragedy again, that's for you alone. Yeah. I, I guess maybe I think that I have some guilt left over from the last time. I think whenever you, you know, even though it was a premature birth, if you lose a child, I think you place some guilt on yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I guess I just do wondering if I shouldn't have done certain things mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Could I have made a difference? Could I have done something differently? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I try to, you know, in my head say, no, you, you had a less schedule than you usually have. You, had, you were more calm. You were resting more. I say all those things to myself logically. But when you go through the loss mm -hmm. there's, and there's no answer, mm -hmm. then you're kind of stuck with, mm -hmm. well, I was the keeper and didn't do well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your mind says you were doing as well as you could possibly do. But something in you says, well, but maybe maybe you could have done something. You were the keeper and you did lose. Yeah. And I think that's part of that though is the reason that I, I still want to have the child. Not only do I want one, but I want to fight back and say, hey, mm -hmm. you know, this mm -hmm. doesn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a winner. Yeah. And, and see, then it comes again into things like I've always had everything I wanted. You know, I was an only child. I was probably a little spoiled. Um, I had a job. I had a career. I've had money. I have a house. You know, I have a decent marriage. I have all the things that sometimes people make comments about of, oh, well, now she has everything. Mm -hmm. And that one thing that I wanted, I didn't get. Mm -hmm. So it would look as though, oh, you've got everything. Not quite, not the important thing you want. No, which then turns things into, for me, into being the failure aspect. Then, Not doing well, of being the failure. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So at some level, to yourself, you're a failure. Yeah. But I suppose all I can do is keep working at it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Of course, then there's the biological time clock. And so not everything is in my corner. That's right. And usually I can work on things or put things in perspective and do things that I have some control. And this is something I don't have control of. That's right. There's some things you can't manage, you can't manipulate, you can't control. No, not this one. At least I don't see that I can. And you're the kind of person who is accustomed to controlling things, getting things your way. Yes. Hasn't worked out bad so far, except for that aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, that's worked fine, but not here. No. And I, I, there is no way to have the control. I mean, I don't know if it's God or fate or whatever is going to make that determination, but it's it's out of my control. And I didn't get the list. It's out of my control. Even mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though I have different kinds of you know medical support that say that I'm healthy and normal and everything is fine, and you know I go to a specialist at this time so that I can try to make things work better. Um, nothing seems to be working right anyway. So you know then I'm back inside myself again with well what's wrong with me? Why isn't this working? How hard can it be? That mm -hmm. seems to be evidence to you. There must be something wrong with me. Yeah. 
It's nobody else's body that's not functioning correctly. It's mine. So this body of yours is something that in this respect you really can't control. No. And I mean, I, I, and I do everything to even try, you know, I do everything the doctor says. Mm -hmm. I eat the right foods. I try to stay in halfway decent shape so that I'm healthy. Mm -hmm. And even that with the loss, nobody can understand how I would lose a child being as healthy as I am. Mm -hmm. You know, and active and not the sickly type. But there's no reason at all for not having a child except that you don't have one. <laughs> so they tell me. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, you know, no matter how logically, the, even the doctor tells me, you know, it's a matter of time, it's a matter of time. Something's not functioning properly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would be right. It would be there. Mm -hmm. and so that brings that sense of failure. Hmm? To me, yes. And I, I guess I want to succeed, and I want everything that I want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and then I look at things, and I say that I would give up. I'd rather give up my career to have a child. If I didn't have a house, that's fine. I could do something else. But um, I can't seem to, to win at that aspect. Mm -hmm. If there were some sacrifice you could make in return for having a child, sure you'd make it. Yeah, I would. I would. Mm -hmm. I would do whatever had to be done. You know, and I make my vows that if I do have a child, I would be the best little parent and all this good stuff. But, mm -hmm. Which then... That really touches you. You just promise to do everything right. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. If. Yeah, if. And I don't know, without the, without the control, I just have to wait, I guess. But it's hard not to have the control. Yeah, if I had the control, you know, it would be done and everything would be fine. And mm -hmm. I'd push the clock back and I'd have a nice little family, a little boy, a little girl, everything would be perfect. It sounds as though there's some grieving over what might have been. Well, I, I think there is to a degree. I don't think that, I think that I dealt with that loss fairly well, that, you know, it's not something that I totally dwell on, and yet, with the thought of a pregnancy, there's the thought of what happened. Um, with the thought of Christmas, there's always the thought of that we visit the grave. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. all those things come up. And create that, some that sadness. That tragedy keeps being lived over again. Yeah. Especially perhaps at this season. Yeah. So the grief is still there. Well, the gr I think the grief comes and goes. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some times that are fine that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that it's very rational and logical to me. And then there's other times that, depending where I am and whom I'm with and what's about and what children are there, you know, things pass through my mind. It can hit you. Yeah, it does. It comes and goes. Mm -hmm. Mm I had to say that you've made it easy to talk about this, though. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? You've made it easy to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Somehow I, I get the feeling that you, uh, you know, I don't think you can understand, I don't think you can feel that same feeling, but I think that you can be empathetic with the situation. You know I can't feel it in my body, what you feel in yours, but at least I have made it easier for you. Yes. 
and and just you know thinking about it in respect to my control and I guess I've come to my own decision or conclusion that I've got to kind of just sit and wait and let what happens happen. Mm -hmm. But I realize I really can't control this. Much as I'm accustomed to controlling, much as I'd like to be able to control it, I cannot control this. No, no matter how hard I try, I can make the best efforts, but I can't control it completely. And yet that doesn't mean that I don't still don't feel like I've made some failure along the way. Mm -hmm. you, know? you say that doesn't keep you from feeling something of a failure. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I, can, I can rationalize and say, mm -hmm. I can't control, there's nothing I can do about it, that's the way it's meant to be. And yet, down in here, it still feels like, well, there's something you could have done or mm -hmm. should do or mm -hmm. whatever. In some sense, I failed. Yeah, maybe not me. Maybe not me exactly. Hmm. I don't. I don't. Maybe not you. No, not me exactly. I mean, I'm not totally responsible. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have the control. I did what I could do, so I'm not the failure. That isn't it exactly. Well. I, know, I, I guess I know I'm not exactly the failure, but there's still that feeling inside me that says that something else could have been done. And maybe Almost it's... It's a bodily feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's not a thinking thing. Mm -hmm. You know, because I realize that. Mm -hmm. But something in you says something might have been done. Yeah. I, I, maybe it's the loss feeling. You know, maybe it's something that says, I don't have this and I still want it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's failure of not being able to fulfill that. Mm -hmm. Mm. Feeling that you're not really fulfilled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Not complete. Not like a real sadness you carry around with you. I think it's a sadness, and yet I think sometimes it it helps me in some of the things that I have to do and some of the things I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Are you saying in some ways it's made you stronger or more able to meet life? Yeah, I think... Um, through some of the things that I've gone through, even with the relationship with my husband, I think through that episode that we shared, there was a lot of strength mm -hmm. between the two. Mm -hmm. And even though there has not been a lot of discussion, you know, as far as how we felt in relation to the loss, I saw a side of my husband I'd never seen before, mm -hmm. which showed me a great strength in him. Mm -hmm. So that in spite of the grief and the loss, some good things emerged from it. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. If if anybody can say something good came from that, yeah. I think the the love and the strength are are good. Mm -hmm. I guess I would just like to complete that, though. By Which I, I'd like to complete that, yeah, though, yeah. by being able to give him a child. It's mm -hmm. a very deep wish. Yeah. I see that our time is almost up. Is there anything more that you want to say? No, just that I appreciated talking with you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But hold it, because we'll, they may want to ask you questions as well as me. Uh, after we've uh, sat here for just a minute, uh, Possibly you'd be willing to think back and say how the interview seemed to you, and then I'll say how it seemed to me, and maybe we could let them in and let them ask questions of us. Would that be okay? Sure. And we can, maybe Ruth can join us too, and, and we can all take part. Do you want to say how the interview seemed to you? When I first came up here, 
I felt very, very tight, and I know that I cross my legs a lot when I sit, and somebody may interpret that as closed. I think this is just comfortable for me. I know that after we took the minute to kind of get a little composure, I felt a lot better. And then as we started to talk, just your facial expression and some of the things that you repeated back to me made me understand some of the things that I was feeling and saying, as well as I think I became more comfortable because I remember I remember touching my chest when I was talking about my feeling, and it wasn't an angry touching or an upset. I was kind of warm and soft, and I felt that way. Um, and I guess the only thing else that I can say is that as I think about it now, and since I teach at a university level about you, and some of my students always wonder how, you know, where do you move and how do you go with just a uh huh and moving on, um, I found it very easy to want to talk with you. I, I didn't feel like I had to prove myself that you had any judgmental type of attitudes toward me, towards me and I felt very comfortable. Okay, I think uh, as far as I'm concerned, I felt um, a little clumsy at first in getting into your world, but then I began to feel more and more comfortably there, so I really did understand. and. Um, I know there was a feeling of being really privileged to uh, enter into you se your sense of loss and what you'd been through and your hopes and then your characteristic of, of being the one in control and that here you'd run into something you couldn't control and uh, I too was moved in that I'm not sure that I know all the significance, but you're putting your hand on your chest. Was uh, it was as though your body was speaking, and I was trying to hear that. Uh, I felt that, uh, in terms of uh, movement, uh, yes, there was some movement, not not fantastic, but. Uh, it was it was it was a half hour of exploration. That's what it seemed like to me of, of getting into different aspects of it. And I felt um, I felt good about the relationship. One thing too, because they have turned down the house lights, so we were just alone for me. Me too. Uh, there just was no one there, and uh, I felt very comfortable in the relationship. Ruth, do you have any comments you want to make? Then we'll open it to the audience. One of the things which seemed important to me was uh, the use of silence. Mm -hmm. um, the way in which um, Peter Ann uh, was silent, but it seemed to be a working silence. And uh, twice I, I felt that because she came to something different at the end of the silence. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was not interrupted. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether Peter Ann felt that or not. I know that when the silence occurred, I know that I was kind of trying to think and, and feel what was going on with me. And so I guess I was trying to draw some kind of closure to where we had been, find what I had touched upon. Get more, um, more familiar and more comfortable with the your own feelings. At yes. That time. Mm -hmm. Yes, I felt those were uh, definitely your silences, and that you were you were quite obviously working during the silent uh, during the silences. Mm -hmm. I, I think part of the time too, I was looking into your face and into your eyes to see, you know, what I was getting from you, mm -hmm. and I think that helped me as well to come to some kind of decisions or conclusions based on the niceness mm. that I saw coming back. Mm. I think I, uh, I have a question, Peter Ann, if you're willing. Um, it seemed 
two or three times who came around to that this was a real loss and there was something wrong and somehow you'd failed. Um, and yet another time, it wasn't all my fault, but there was something wrong. And um, I was sensing for myself some feeling of um, angry about the loss and not being able to do anything about it. Was that off the track? No, there's, defi there's definitely some anger that I can't control that situation or could not control it at the time. But I think there's always the guilt. If, there was a, if a doctor could say, you lost these twins because, that would be acceptable. They can't give me an answer. You know, it's just a premature birth. And so you're kind of left without any answer. And so with that, I think I have feelings of maybe I shouldn't have washed the dishes or maybe I shouldn't have swept the floor, mm -hmm. but I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that's going to be out there forever, unclear. Mm -hmm. Now if you'll turn up the house lights, then we can get questions from the, from the audience. <laughs> I don't know that I can see well enough to really select people, but if, you, if you'd come to the center microphone, if you do have questions, one of the center microphones, and you can ask questions of, of me or of Peter Ann, or just make comments, whatever. Turn on the center mics, please. There it is. Okay, try um, it again. Peter Ann, this was a question for you, um, and Carl, maybe you can comment on it. As I watched the interview, um, I had a sense that when you started out, you were at one level of talking about your experiences in the moment, of your fears about being pregnant, um, and the excitement and both the fear about that. And as the interview progressed, um, my sense was that you went from a stance where you were more, earlier on in the interview, I felt you were blaming yourself a lot and calling yourself a failure. And I noticed, or I felt, that during, toward the end of the interview, you seemed to be more able to entertain the notion that something was wrong and that it was not necessarily you who were wrong. And to me, that felt like one of those maybe not so minuscule changes that someone was commenting about earlier on in the therapy, and I wonder if you'd make some comments to that. The, you want me to make comments to the about, feeling? Did you feel that? Was that an accurate perception, or did you see a change from the beginning to the end? I, I think I saw a change from the beginning and the end to I started out with my narrow scope of that I had a loss. Mm -hmm. And then I think there are so many more things that play on that that I saw myself changing to not only the loss aspect, but all these other things that affect me mm -hmm. in relation to the loss. And yes, I don't think that it is my fault. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think I, I, I tend to blame myself. Mm -hmm. I do. And I'm not sure that I'll, I'll ever get over blaming myself. And yet, at this very moment, I realize more and more that it's, there's nothing I could do about mm -hmm. that. I guess I felt the shift from blame to loss during the course of the interview. Mm -hmm. I was impressed too, if I can comment on that, when you, when you uh, said toward the end that uh, when I said you're a failure and you said no, not me exactly, that was, uh, that was very impressive because I felt you were uh, realizing no, it was a limited, limited part of anything, that your part in it as far as any blame, any possible blame was concerned was very, very limited. And it, it wasn't a failure of you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I have been uh, a little puzzled by the remark you made, uh, uh, Peter Ann, to uh, Carl Rogers, about him being not empathetic. Uh, and I think I understood that. And uh, Mr. Rogers, you tried to clarify that by saying, uh, I did not understand, I'm not understanding with my body what you are feeling in your body. But I don't think Peter Ann was talking about your body as being different. I think she was talking, 
She was just strictly saying that you were not really understanding what she was feeling. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to be very presumptuous. Uh, and I hope you'll forgive me for doing so. But I think what you were saying, Peter Ann, is that you made a decision years ago to have a career rather than have children. And now you're 35 and your biological clock is ticking away. And the guilt you are feeling, I think, is about having made that decision and there's nothing you can do. You are willing to trade anything you have to not have made that decision. But you made that decision years ago and you don't know what to do. The doctors, if the doctor is telling you, you know, you lost your babies for this or that, uh, you're looking for an answer and in fact you have the answer. Do you have any comments you want to make or not? Yeah, um, I'll make a couple. One, when I made the comment to Dr. Rogers, I think I was I was coming from a point of, of thinking that this is, and this is going to sound terrible and sexist, but this is a woman's loss that you could not, you know, understand that aspect. And, not, and it wasn't that I didn't think you were empathetic with me, but that kind of a feeling. The other aspect about feeling guilty about my career, definitely I feel that way to a degree, and I know that. And yet... Um, if I had it to do all over again, knowing Would what I you? know now, I might change it. Would you? Knowing what I know now, I might change it. Right. But I'm not positive that I would because I, what I have gained and what I am is important to me. It's just not as important at this point because what I want, I can't have. And I think that's what draws it out in me the most is that now I want this and I can't have it. And so, yes, I'm angry that I did this, but I'm not sure I would change that. You're angry that you did this, and I think w that decision you did years ago was a decision about, the word that comes to my mind is a selfish, de selfish decision. And when now you would like, I'm sorry. All right. All right. I think what, they're, I think what the audience is reacting to is the finality of your judgment about this as though here is the real truth. Okay. Well, I think from confronting some part of our decisions, and I'm not saying that the decision you made was wrong. I'm not saying that at all. But I think by facing the, 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 this, the, the fact that you made some decision years ago, um, anyway, there's nothing I, much I, I can say. I think most of what you've said she already said in her in her interview but then when you sum it up in a very final way as though here it is that i think it's the tone of voice that rubs Maybe. people a little the wrong way i'm sorry and i guess i look at it that he's entitled to his opinion i would give him that much i was the <laughs> no i didn't mean that nasty i i mean i would i could understand his side also also, I, I was glad to know I really did understand when you were saying, yes, it was, a, it was a woman's problem. I couldn't fully understand it, no matter what, just from a physiological point of view. I was very struck that uh, most of the time, Dr. Rogers, the words that you used when you talked back to Peter Ann were her words. And I was thinking about the way that I do therapy, where I often change the words or say something different and the feeling that I began to get was that that was a very effective way of tuning in to you Peter Ann in terms of just that flow of real positive energy and love between you because you were hearing very explicitly the same things that you had said said in a very sympathetic and loving way when you talked about Dr. Rogers looking you or you looking at his eyes and his face and experiencing that kind of feeling. I certainly experienced that in the audience as well. So I guess my question really was for you, Peter Ann, is what that felt like for you to hear your words coming back to you and not something in addition, particularly during the first part of the interview. I used to always think that that would be frustrating, but in that experience, 
I think it made things clear and it pointed out to me what I was thinking and feeling and saying that maybe sometimes I speak and don't really think what I say and it helped me to understand. One, one thing I would say on that is that you're quite right, there was more of that at the first of the interview and had we gone on to other interviews, probably I, I would have used less of her words, there would have been more catching the underlying feeling, some of that was beginning to go on. Um, I've, my, my intent in the interview was to really be a companion to Peter Ann in her world and any way I can get inside that world is okay by me and sometimes it is by uh, repeating, sometimes it's by trying to sense the feeling that underlies the words. Um, but I but I do want to be enough of a companion to the client so that the client feels released to go forward. And um, also, I want to make the relationship so safe that things that can't be said can be said. And feelings that can't be experienced can that cannot be experienced can be experienced in the relationship. And um, that is my intent. Uh, we only had half an hour's worth, so uh, only to some degree was that, uh, could that be achieved. Dr. Rogers? Um, it seems to me that, that when I heard Virginia Satir speak this morning and later on heard Ernest Rossi and, and now you, that, that all of you are making reference to kind of a physically experiencing self that's somehow separate from, from the intellect uh, and that sometimes the intellect and this physically experiencing self aren't as close of friends as they might be. Um, now we all know that, that we spend small fortunes and many, many hours developing that kind of intellectual self. Um, could you speak to the development of that physical experiencing self? Now let me say first that I think you're quite right that uh, our intellectual processes often go off in one direction and our experiences in another. And there were one or two small examples of that in this where your mind was telling you you're not guilty, for example, and yet you experience guilt. Uh, I think that uh, our educational institutions do a great deal to help us develop persons who uh, are guided by intellect and rational thought and so on, and who often get further and further from the actual things that they're experiencing. And it is that gap which makes for a great deal of uh, psychological difficulty and maladjustment. Um, I, I think there is no fundamental reason why we couldn't be educated to trust our experience as well as our intellect. But unfortunately, uh, that's not often the case. And many of us grew up to trust the intellect and the rational and the reasoning and get quite out of touch with what we're actually experiencing. So that, uh, yes, I do feel that's an important thing. And, an, and something that probably ties together a great many rather different therapeutic points of view. Which reminds me of one other thing I want to say about my style in, in responding to a client. I'm not saying that's the way you should respond. Uh, I feel that uh, each person has to develop their own mode of therapy. Uh, my feeling is if you, well I'll, I'll put it very specifically, if you record your interviews and study them later, you will find things that you do that are very helpful, perhaps they're very specific to you. You'll also find things that you do that really don't seem to advance the process at all uh, and that perhaps get in the way of it and those you can drop. So that I'm not talking about just doing what you feel like doing, but after carefully studying what you do, then gradually developing your own way of being with another person, which is helpful. And that I think is uh, I don't, I don't ask anybody to do what I do. I do it because that's good. That's a way I've found of being helpful to people. 
your way may, might be different. But examine what you do so as to make sure that what you're doing is helpful and not unhelpful. At, at some point, uh, <laughs> at some point along the interview, there seemed to be a, and it was exciting to me to hear, uh, a, a sort of a change of valence whereby this tragic event began to take on some positive aspects. I think Peter Ann mentioned that she saw a different side of her husband, a, a sense of strength. And I was just wondering how each of you experienced that, whether there was anything in either of your experiences that annotated that change, and, and was there any selectivity in how you were reflecting back the, the information that Peter Ann was giving you? Um, my comment would be that I, I believe we were talking about the failure aspect and we were talking about the loss and it came to me as it did then and does periodically that there was some very good moments even though it was tragic and that makes me feel good. That may have even been when I put my hand on my chest, I'm not sure, it may have been in the same area. But there are some very good points of that. and. I guess I'm not exactly sure how we got there, except I think we were talking about the failure aspect, and I think I, I, I'm not totally a failure, and that there are some good things that came from that, and I helped with those and learned some things through those. I just wouldn't be sure at this moment how we arrived at that point. I'd have to see the videotape or listen to the recording to, to find out. But, uh, and I, I certainly felt that shift in evaluation of it, but I wouldn't want to, um, but both sides were there. That is, the, the grief and the loss and the tragedy, and the fact that some good things came out of it. And I wanted to be respectful of, of both sides. But it is true that that positive side came out. I saw the interview as starting out uh, broadening in scope as it went on, becoming more exploratory. And more things were dealt with. But I guess, Peter Ann, my concern is that you'll go on exploring, uh, the scope will broaden. Do you think that the client-centered approach would be enough to resolve your conflicts? I think that had we had more time or further interviews that we could have explored the avenues that I mentioned. I think they all play a part for me. And maybe it did seem like it broadened, and yet I think those were things that I felt more safe to bring in, that this bothers me too, and so does this in relation to that. And I would hope that we would eventually deal with those and I could come to some closure on them. Thank you for that. But I guess my further concern would be that you were a very vocal client. You could say what you wanted to say, and you had, you had all your feelings out in the open. I have to go back to a culture. In South, I have to go back to South Africa. And I know that most of the clients that I will work with won't be able to express themselves that well. Dr. Rogers, what do I do? I think I can answer that very briefly, but it's not easy to put into effect. You can be very, very present to your clients. I think to be really present in the relationship is one of the keys to therapy. How you will be present, I don't know. It's quite true that Peter Ann was a very articulate person. Uh, but the difference between an articulate person and a very silent person uh, isn't all that great. I, I recently had occasion to go over the, uh, some of the recorded interviews that I held with a schizophrenic client in the when we were doing our research on working with schizophrenics. And the length of some of those silences, 16 minutes of silence, my God. Um, and yet, that was a working silence, and at the end of that, some very important things came out. I guess I would say that the significant themes in any interview are usually very few, very few. 
They can be stated in a few sentences. And some people who are very silent and not articulate, nonverbal, may only utter a few sentences during the time you have with them. But if you've made it a safe place, a place where they can feel free, those sentences will have real significance. The more articulate person also says a few very significant things, but also gives many of the details and helps, helps us to understand the context and so on. Uh, but the difference between dealing with an inarticulate and an articulate client is not as great as it's sometimes uh, supposed to be, in my experience. Thank you. The primary thing I've come to this conference looking for is uh, commonalities between one practitioner and another. And I think I uh, saw, the, saw one of those today. In the hour before this, I sat in with uh, Dr. Ernest Rossi talking about hypnotherapy. And he emphasized there uh, the minute rapport between a therapist and client. Uh, I saw you doing it uh, <clears throat> very much in tune. I, I want to use a word larger than empathy. Um, empathy seems to me to relate to the content and the emotion. What I saw was in, in your very uh, physical processes, I, a sense, an exquisite sense of timing and skill that uh, that I don't do in sessions when I am nervous, that I didn't do when I was less experienced. Uh, it seems to me that perhaps what you do well is something that hypnotherapists have put under the microscope and talked about. Um, have you ever thought of yourself as doing something very much like hypnotherapy? Have you ever analyzed in that, when you talk about analy analyzing the minute moment to moment fluctuations. Are you aware of your sense of timing, of your respect for her uh, broken eye contact while she's thinking, and you, and you recognize it? Uh, I don't know this in any Rogerian therapy I've ever been taught. I guess I would say that um, I've come to place a larger and larger emphasis on the intuitive aspect of the relationship. I don't know that that was, uh, you feel you saw some of that here, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I do feel that uh, that is one commonality that I share with the, the work of Erickson, for example. Uh, I, I am not one who pays attention to things like you said, the broken eye contact and so on. Uh, I'm sure I take account of that at some intuitive level. But no, that's not something I think about, and I'm not sure that it's helpful to think about it. People might differ on that. Uh, at any rate, I, uh, I appreciate your comment, and I applaud your search for finding some of the commonalities, because I think there are commonalities between different therapists and different therapeutic uh, points of view. I thought I detected throughout a large portion of the session a, an emotional message in the shakiness of Peter Ann's voice. And my question to you, Dr. Rogers, is was there a specific reason why you chose to respond to her words, as was mentioned earlier, you, you responded very often in, just, in her words and you did not choose to respond to the nonverbal message that she was giving you in her shaky voice. I wonder if there was a reason for you making that choice. I guess I responded to it in my way. I certainly noticed the shakiness in her voice, which came and went. But I, I responded to it in different ways. I remember at one point saying, that was very, very hard. And uh, uh, I was responding to the fact that uh, she was close to some very deep emotions. I might have responded differently or perhaps better, but I was not unaware of, of what you're talking about. Do you have any comment on that, Peter? Not really, although I knew that I had tears in my eyes and I know that I had the shaky response, and yet I felt that I was being responded to and being allowed to do those things. Perhaps one more question right, on thank the you. interview? 
Is there another question? Yes. Um, I, the picture that you get on the screen is a little different than I get when I'm looking right here, but when you were first starting and when I was looking at uh, Peter Ann, I was seeing her face and I was seeing the colors that she chose to wear, and my first impression was, this is a woman in mourning. And I'm wondering if sometimes I My have... luggage didn't arrive. Okay. <laughs> this is what I flew in yesterday. I can often be wrong with my wonderings, and I'm wondering, <laughs> Dr. Rogers, if you ever have those kinds of first impressions, and do you wonder out loud about them with your clients at all? I guess I'd put it more broadly. Uh, some quick impression, I probably don't voice, any persistent feeling, if I had felt, for example, that... Uh, uh, she was always on the verge of tears or something like that. Yes, I would, and wait a minute. Any persistent feeling in myself, I would express. So that if I became concerned or uh, had a certain feeling, yes, I would express that to her. Uh, but uh, in wonderings of the sort that you're mentioning, I don't do much of that. Uh, that may be a loss to me, but uh, uh, I was really, for example, to be specific, I really was not aware that uh, when she began to talk about her loss that she also was wearing dark clothing. And so I'm quite interested in finding that, well, that's due to lack of luggage, not necessarily due to choice. So I think... Uh, such wonderings perhaps are useful, but uh, they can be overdone. I think perhaps now we've talked enough about the interview, and I certainly appreciate, um, Peter Ann, appreciate very much your willingness.